the epistle for this beautiful Easter day is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Brethren, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new dough, as you really are without leaven. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep festival, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Mark chapter 16. At that time, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had just risen. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone back from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, for it was very large. But on entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be terrified. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he told you. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On the first Easter day, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared five times to different chosen souls. First, he appeared to St. Mary Magdalene. Well, in the Gospels, that's recorded, the five times. But we know by tradition that he first appeared to his Blessed Mother. At three o'clock in the morning, when he rose from the dead, he first came to her. And some of the fathers of the church even say that our Lord brought not just himself and the millions of angels, but he even brought some of the great prophets like Moses and Isaiah and David to venerate the Virgin Mary from limbo. He brought them out with him. And so that's not recorded in Scripture. But the other five are, which is he appeared to uh, St. Mary Magdalene, to St. Peter alone, being the chief, the head of the church, the visible head, and then to the, to the women the, that were going, the three Marys, who were going to anoint his body, and then to all the apostles, minus St. Thomas, and we'll see what happens with him next Sunday. And then lastly, on this Easter afternoon, in the afternoon, he walked seven miles from Emmaus, Jerusalem to Emmaus, with the two disciples, Cleophas, and some think it's St. Luke that was with him, St. Luke and Cleophas. So five different times our Lord showed his, his real flesh, his real body. And it's so beautiful, this whole Mass, every single word of the Gospel, there's melodies of Gregorian chant, sung at Vespers, Lauds, at all the divine office. So now with the availability of being able to hear all kinds of good music that's available through internet, you can hear all the Easter riches, the treasures of the church. And these melodies, they never leave you. Once they get into your heart, into your blood, into your bones, they, they stay with you. These melodies come from the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And just for example, the Victime of Pascali Laudes, this, this sequence of the Mass. If we had a high Mass, you would hear all, some of these treasures. But then in the monasteries, they sing the whole, all, all these melodies. And it's just beautiful. They are very beautiful. And Easter Sunday is not just today. The whole week is a first class feast. It's like one huge day. So 
There's so much to say, and I've got such little time to say it, but let me just say this. It was by the tree that breath, that the breath of Satan brought in death to the soul. Because our first mother, Eve, dialogued in a dialogue of death with the serpent. And in the very first sentence, the devil's already lying to her. So the devil is the father of lies. So we never want to be addicted to that horrible vice of lying. And parents, you want to always catch that in children. If you catch them lying, show them the horror of lying. Because it really can mess up their whole life. People who lie, they get in the habit of lying and they start living a lie. So you don't want to, we, we never want to have anything to do with lies. But the father of lies, in his first sentence, he's telling them already three lies. And he says, oh, you won't die the death. But God told them, you will die the death if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You eat of this ugly looking tree, the one surrounded by thorns in the middle of nowhere, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. And all they had to do was obey. Just don't eat that fruit. Stay away from it. But Eve got curious. She dialogued with the devil. And the tree, she plucked the fruit off that tree and ate it. And then gave it to Adam. And that brought death. Granted, Adam and Eve lived 930 years of penance and prayer. And they are saints. They did go to heaven. And, but our Lord, he's giving us today, at the first resurrection, uh, when he dies on the cross, he made holy this tree. And this tree is the new tree of paradise. And we eat of the fruit of this tree in the Holy Eucharist. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. What's this fruit of Mary's womb? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you eat in Holy Communion. And we even have it better than Adam and Eve, because Adam and Eve, they had to eat of the tree of life just once in a while. It kept them young, it kept them healthy, it kept them from sickness, it kept their immune system 100% all the time. And that's all they had to do, just once in a while eat of this tree of life. But they lost the tree of life because they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, and it was shut. So... Christ gave us back this tree of life. And the tree of life is more powerful, this one, because it's God himself, and not just the fruit of a tree. But he is that fruit, his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the whole Eucharist. And he gives not just a long life, healthy life on earth, he gives you both eternal life of your soul in the happiness of heaven, and we already walk in heaven, taste heaven, by walking and living in the state of grace. By living in the state of grace, which we must strive to do all, all, always, strive to live always in the state of grace and grow in that, you already possess heaven and God possesses you because the Blessed Trinity lives in your soul. And those who die in the state of grace do go to heaven, even if they have to pass through some purge, purge time in purgatory. They're going to go to heaven. So this fruit gives also um, immortal life of the soul, but also the immortal life of the body. That's a fact. The body will live forever because we're going to rise from the dead at the last day. All Everybody, the damned and the, the saints, the sheep and the goats, everyone will rise from the dead. And the body will share in the happiness of heaven. And that's why, for example, St. Gertrude the Great, this holy nun, the twin sister to St. Mechthild, and our Lord appeared actually to both of them very, very often. And St. Gertrude once saw in heaven St. Benedict, because she was Benedictine, her father. And he, there he was, his whole robe, Benedictine robe, was brilliant with gold. And all the light of his soul shined through the body. Well, he doesn't have his body yet, but his soul was shining. So when the saints have their body again, the body will share in the glory 
and the, the body, just like the, the light bulbs, the light comes from within and shines out. That's what the state of grace will be in heaven. The vision of the Blessed Trinity, the life of the Blessed Trinity in the soul, will shine through the body. So everyone will shine with different wattage. That's true. St. Thomas says that. And that's why the saints are pictured with halos, because they really do shine. The life of the grace shines through the body. Plus, you'll be able to fly where you want. You won't need tunnels to go through uh, mountains. You just pass through matter. You won't need doors to walk through. Because Christ, when he rose from the dead, he passed through the walls of the cynical. That's one of the qualities of the resurrected body. You'll be able to pass through matter, as Christ did. And then you'll be able to, of course, uh, this is the, the great uh, great one for, the, the one we can comprehend the most is agility. You can, you can fly through the air because the body will be subject to the soul. And just as Christ rose off the earth as his ascension, so you'll be able to fly where you want, and you'll be able to do anything. The body will be completely submissive to the soul, and it won't get hurt, it won't get sick, it will never die. So God is not boring, you know, if he makes the, the, the dolphins laugh and jump with joy in the ocean, and schools of fish dance their glory of God as they swim with all their bright colors. Certainly, God is, there's going to be games among the saints and certainly innocent dances of this sort to, to express the love and the joy of God himself among the saints. So imagine seeing the eyes of St. Lucy that were plucked out in her martyrdom. Those eyes are going to shine with a special glory and splendor and you're going to look into those eyes those smiling eyes of saint lucy and meet her for the first time and she was a beautiful girl and saint anastasia and saint agatha and saint cecilia and saint Lu saint um, ladvina and all these saints the apostles you will meet saint bernard saint claire saint francis and saint francis is among the seraphim but he's the most, he's so raised so high because he's the most humble. And I'm sure when you meet St. Francis, you'll be just struck by his humility and his laughter, his, his innocence. That's how the saints are. They shine with these simple virtues of humility and love of God. <clears throat> so the gift of agility, clarity, the shining of the soul through the body, also impassibility. The body will never get sick or die. It'll never, you'll never, if there's a hockey game, for example, there won't be any broken bones, no concussions, nothing like that. And if you want to jump off a cliff and do a perfect dive into the ocean, 500 feet high, 1,000 feet high, won't, won't even bother you. And you'll be able to stop in midair as well. And St. Thomas even says, You'll be able to appear and reappear because Christ vanished. Remember, at the disciples of Emmaus, when he broke, blessed the bread with the sign of the cross, he broke the bread and vanished from their sight. So, St. Thomas says, the resurrected body, you'll imagine the games of hide and seek you'll be able to play. And that's true. The, the, the saints are not boring, that's for sure. <laughs> And the body will be able to appear and reappear in a mysterious way, because our Lord did it. And then the last is uh, subtlety, which is, I already said, was passing through matter, passing through the walls. And you won't need airplanes. You just fly. But you won't be able to fly as fast as angels. Angels move with the speed of thought, because they don't have bodies. That's why they're pictured with wings because they move with the speed of thought. So if, if an angel right now was hovering around the Mass here for, in Chicago, getting ready for Mass, and he wants to go to China, he just thinks China and he's there. While the resurrected body will, will have to take some time because it's a physical body moving through, through time and through the air. 
So, and that's the unique thing about Fatima. When the Virgin Mary appeared at Fatima, um, some theologians say this is very, Fatima is very special among all the other apparitions because when Our Lady appeared on the home oak tree, the branches actually lowered to show that it was actually her body from heaven that appeared. Normally, normally an apparition is just an intellectual vision. But with this vision of Fatima, it was Our Lady for real. And it's very serious. Fatima is very serious, and it's scorned and spit on by all the modernists in Rome. They hate Fatima. They hate Fatima. The proof is the fake Sister Lucy, and who knows what they did with the real one. I think they killed her. But that's just my two-cent opinion. I think someday she'll be proclaimed a martyr, because uh, they probably killed her. Because if they killed Pope John Paul I in 30 days, they sure did everything to crush Fatima. But we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. But she certainly was a martyr in, in her convent, Sister Lucy. And Fatima is so important. And we got to, it's more pertinent than ever. Everything Our Lady of Fatima said, we're living through. And the apostasy is at the top. And they won't reveal the full third secret. Why? What are these modernists got to hide? What the problem is, if they reveal, reveal the third secret, it condemns Vatican II, the new mass, and the whole conciliar false religion. That's why they don't want to reveal it. Our Lady had them pegged in 1917. So Our Lady, her, her to just to see the Virgin Mary, and in heaven you will always see the most blessed Trinity, but that's so indescribable, I'm not even going to try to attempt that, to, to see God. But you get a little image of it, because the, when St. Bernadette saw the Virgin Mary, she was in such ecstasy of joy that the doctors in the later apparitions were testing her out to see if she was a fraud. So they put a candle under her folded hands as she was praying the rosary. She didn't even feel the, the flame didn't even bother her. But when Our Lady left, and the vision left at Lourdes in France, then she felt the pain, and she said, Ouch, why are you burning me? <clears throat> so if the, to see Our Lady eliminates just all pain, what must be the beauty of the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother, just to see her? Saints who have seen her, most saints who have seen the Virgin Mary have been privileged with, be, with being incorrupt. They never rotted. St. Bernadette, St. John Vianney, St. John Bosco, and St. Pius X, St. Um, Thomas de Corey. He used to see the Virgin Mary and speak with her. And many of these saints who have seen her never corrupted because Our Lady, she's, she's so beautiful. So... Christ is the life of all. He gives life to everything. Plants, insects, fish, human beings, angels. All comes from Him. All life. But the highest life is the life of the supernatural order, the life of grace, the life of the soul. And, and Christ being life, life being put to death, gave us life. Life itself being put to death on the tree of the cross, by that death gives us life, the life of the soul. And that life is poured out through the five fountains of the wounds of Christ, which are flooded out to us through the seven sacraments. Baptism washes the soul with Christ's blood. Sacrament of confession washes the soul with Christ's blood, strengthens the soul, heals the wounds of sin, and strength, strengthens you to keep fighting. But the most, the, the most beautiful and the best and the center of all the sacraments is the Holy Eucharist, which is Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity under the appearance of bread and wine. And this is, if we could see what the Mass is, we would just all die out of love. Our souls would be snatched right out of the body, attracted by the beauty of God himself in the Holy Eucharist. 
but he hides his glory. Christ hides his glory because he knows he doesn't want to scare us. We're going to see that scary glory on the Day of Judgment. And that's going to make everybody tremble and sweat, especially the damned. They'll be howling. But Christ, in his divine wisdom and goodness and simplicity and love, humbles himself, hides his glory, so that we come to love him as our God, as our Savior, as our best of friends, as our spouse, and as a priest. He is our Christ of the Blessed Trinity. I'm married to God. I'm consecrated to Him as a priest. And a nun, a spouse, Christ is their spouse by the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. So that marriage is very special for consecrated souls. But those, who, those of you who are not consecrated as mon monks, nuns, or priests, still Christ wants you in that, that unique union with Him by the life of grace, by a union of love, by a union of friendship. Christ wants that friendship with us. It's a mysterious thing. But, we, I mean, he, the novice ordo, of course, has gone way overboard. They, they treat, they've eliminated Christ as God, and they just uh, treat Christ as the buddy to receive in your hands. And that's, Christ is not just the brother. He, is, he wants to be our brother, but also God. He's always God. And that's what the true Catholic Mass always teaches us. The, the humility, the closeness of God, yet the respect and the awe and the reverence due to Him. That's preserved in the Tridentine Mass of the Latin Rite. And in the other Eastern Rites, it's also preserved the magnificent chants, the golden vestments, the incense, everything is very reverent and sacred and solemn because you're dealing with God. In all the true rites of the Catholic Church, especially the Queen of the Rites, which is the Latin Roman Rite, it preserves that attitude we need to always have towards God, which is lost in the New Mass. The New Mass eliminates Christ as God, and He's just... I don't know what they make of him. Even if, if, if they think of him, he's just a buddy, a, a chewing gum buddy. That's not our God. He is, he wants, but he does want the friendship of our souls. So let's turn to the Mother of God and uh, imagine the joy of Our Lady because her sorrows were so great. St. Bernardine of Siena said that if Our Lady could parcel out to the whole human race, just equal, equally among the entire human race, to taste some of the, joy, the sorrows of Our Lady, just taste a little bit of her sorrows, it would kill us. Her sorrows were so great, it was miraculous that she could survive the crucifixion and the passion, and then Holy Saturday. So she was so, her sorrows uh, are indescribable. So as low as her sorrows went, so much Christ exalted her. The humble will be exalted. And there's no one more humble than Our Lady and no one more worthy of exaltation than her. So let's put ourselves under her care, under her protection, and be truly loving sons and daughters of the Virgin Mary. And if you're close to her, she's going to get you to heaven. That's her. She's a mother. She's going to do it. So be close to her. Honor her with the rosary, as Our Lady of Fatima asked us to do. And on this day, may the joys of, and graces of this whole week, like one big day, fill your soul, sanctify you, and give you a little taste of the joys waiting, that eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor can any man possibly imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. O oh, Mary conceived without sin, pray for us of recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us to have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us to have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.